Section one of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Pinniger. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. Preface. In bringing together these old classics for children, the author of the book has sought to apply the rule laid down in her preceding book, The Art of Storytelling, and to paint each story against some universal background of truth. The occasional exceptions are the stories of pure fancy or delicious nonsense. None of the stories depict physical cruelty or violence, from which children instinctively shrink. Neither is craftiness or fraud or lying rewarded. Yet the stories are full of romance and adventure, and of the old-time fairy lore which children love. Changes in the original stories have been freely made when necessary to bring them into conformity with the above conditions, for these old folk and fairy tales belong to all peoples and all times, and, as in the olden days, so now, the stamp of the individual storyteller may be renewedly impressed upon them. It is hoped that the stories may prove a source of true joy to the children who read, as well as to storytellers and listeners. J. D. C. End of section one. Recording by James Pinniger. Section two of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Pinniger. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. Section 2 The Three Lemons from Labelay. Once upon a time, there was a prince named Carlino who lived with his father, the king, in the Palace of Rubies. The king was growing old, and he wished, oh, how he wished that his son would marry, and he told his wish to all his people. He must have a wife who is young, and rich, and beautiful, the king said. But more than all this, she must be loving and good. So they searched all the country over for a wife for Carlino, but the prince only ran away to the woods, and declared that he would not marry at all. The king was sad and sorry indeed, but one day a strange thing happened. As the king and the prince sat together at dinner, the prince cut his finger with a knife, Three drops of blood fell into a dish of cream at the prince's plate. The prince stared into the dish, then suddenly exclaimed, My father, I see a vision of a beautiful maiden whose skin is as fair and smooth as cream, and whose cheeks and lips are red as these drops of blood. I am going to seek her. When I have found her, I shall marry her and bring her to the palace of rubies. With that, he mounted the most magnificent horse in all the king's stables and galloped away. A long, long time he journeyed. He visited towns and villages, he entered castles and cottages, but nowhere did he see the maiden of his vision. At last, after days and weeks and months of journeying, he came to a place called World's End. There was nothing but a line of shore, and beyond it stretched sea and sky and mist. Carlino looked about. An old man sat on the shore alone. What sea is this, good father? asked Carlino. It is the sea without a shore, replied the old man. Away beyond the horizon, lost in the mist, is an island. Three sisters dwell on the island, but none who go there ever come back. But a prince may succeed where others have failed, said Carlino, and he stepped into a boat which lay on the shore. No sooner was the prince seated than the boat shot through the water like an arrow from a bow. In a short time, Carlino came within sight of the mysterious island. Its coast was rough, and its cliffs were rugged, but the moment the boat touched the shore, Carlino began to climb. When he reached the top, he found three huts. He knocked at the door of the first. I can do nothing for you, cried a snarling voice, but go to my sister who lives beyond. Carlino knocked at the door of the second hut. I can do nothing for you, cried a plaintive voice, but go to my sister who lives beyond. 
Carlino hurried on and knocked at the door of the third hut. Perhaps I can help you, cried a pleasant voice, and a young woman opened the door of the hut. Carlino told her his story, and when he had finished she gave him three lemons and a beautiful knife with a handle of mother of pearl. Take these, she said, and hasten back to your father, the king. When you reach the borders of your own country, stop at the first spring of water, and there you must cut in two these lemons. As you cut each, there will spring forth a beautiful fairy with skin like cream and lips like drops of blood. She will ask you for a drink of water. Give it to her quickly, or she will vanish from your sight. But if the first and the second leave you, be sure to capture the third. If you do not, I can do nothing more to help you. But if you give her the water quickly, she will stay with you and love you, and you shall make her your wife. Prince Carlino thanked the young woman, folded the precious lemon safely in his mantle, and hastened to his boat. He met with many adventures on the way, but at last he reached the borders of his father's kingdom, and came to the spring of water. His heart beat fast as he took his knife and cut the first lemon. Out sprang a wonderful fairy, who asked Carlino for a drink of water. But he, poor fellow, was so amazed at the wonderful sight that he stood a moment as though rooted to the ground, and immediately the fairy disappeared. Ah, why did I lose so beautiful a creature, cried Carlino. Then he cut the second lemon. Out sprang a fairy as beautiful as the first, and asked for a drink of water. But again Carlino was so amazed that he moved but slowly, and the fairy disappeared. Woe is me, cried Carlino, if I capture not the third. Then he cut the remaining lemon, and there sprang forth the most beautiful fairy of them all, and before she had finished asking for water, Carlino was upon his knees, offering her a brimming cup. The fairy, whose skin was like cream, and whose lips were like drops of blood, smiled and thanked the prince, and after drinking the water, gave him her hand. Carlino was half afraid that it was a dream from which he would awaken, but the fairy promised to marry him and to go with him to the Palace of Rubies. But you must go as a true princess, said Carlino. Wait here while I hasten to my father. I will return for you with attendants, with horses, and with royal splendor. Then shall you appear before the king in a manner befitting a princess. So Carlino hastened away, and the fairy, feeling frightened at being left alone in the woods, sprang into a tree and hid among the leaves. A few moments later, a black slave came to the spring to draw water. She was ugly of face and of temper, for she had never known anything in all her life but hard labour and abuse. As she stooped to fill her jar, she saw in the clear water the reflection of the fairy's beautiful face. She looked up. Why are you there? she cried. The fairy who had only known love and happiness all her life, and who trusted everyone, replied, I am waiting for the prince to come and make me his bride. Then a wicked idea came to the mind of the old slave. She would shake the fairy into the stream and take her place in the tree. Then, when the prince came, she would say that she was the fairy, and that a witch had changed her to her present ugly form. She raised her arm to shake the tree. But the fairy understood what she meant to do, and quickly flew away in the form of a dove. When the prince returned, he was quite beside himself with grief and amazement. But the old slave declared that she was the fairy in disguise, and at last he took her to the palace of rubies. I will have no black slaves inherit my throne, stormed the king. But his prime minister told him that the ugly negress was a fairy in disguise that such changes had often occurred, and that no doubt the bride would become as beautiful as before when the marriage ceremony was performed. So at last the king consented, and preparations for the wedding were begun, but the king and Prince Carlino were in great distress. One day, just before the wedding, Prince Carlino noticed, growing close to the palace wall, a little lemon tree which had not been there before. He asked about it, and the chef of the palace told him, a dove lighted near the kitchen window, and as I needed one more for our feast, I killed it. Three drops of blood fell upon the ground, and almost at once this lemon tree sprang up. Prince Carlino looked closely at the little tree, and behold, there were three lemons on its branches. 
He seized them and ran to his room, opened the knife, which he always carried, and filled a jeweled cup with water. Then, trembling, he cut the lemons as before, and, as before, a fairy sprang from each. The first and second disappeared, but to the third he offered the cup of water. For the third fairy was his true bride, come back to him again. Everyone in the palace declared that the wicked negress should be put to death. But before this was done, the fairy said to the king, I am sure you will grant me a wedding gift. The king was so happy that he answered, I will give you anything that you ask. Then, said the fairy, give me the life of this woman now condemned to death. Uh, truly, it is a poor gift, said the king, but I have given my word. But why do you wish it? he added. Ah, said the fairy bride, she has never known anything but hard labour and abuse. I will give her a happier life, and she will find goodness through loving. My dear, said the king, now I know of a truth that the bride of Prince Carlino is as good as she is beautiful. So the prince and the fairy were married, and they lived happily ever after. End of section two. Recording by James Pinnegar. Section three of Favourite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Pinnegar. Favourite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowes. Section 3. The Twelve Months from Labourlay. Once upon a time, a poor peasant woman was left a widow. She had a daughter whose name was Laboga, and a little serving maid whose name was Debranca. Now, Debranca was good and kind, and as beautiful as she was good, whilst Laboga was proud and cruel. Debranca was given all the hard tasks and all the scoldings, whilst Laboga did only fine stitching and was petted and praised. One day in January there was to be a party in the neighbourhood, so Laboga could go, for though her mother was so poor, she had a fine party dress. But Debranca could not go, for she had nothing fit to wear. Debranca was very unhappy, but neither Laboga nor her mother cared for that. When the day of the party came, Sloboga declared that she must have a bunch of violets to wear. They would just match the colour of my dress, she said. But violets do not blossom in January, exclaimed Debranca. I care not, said Sloboga, with a stamp of her foot. You are to find me a bunch of violets, and do not come back till you bring them. Poor Debranca was pushed out into the cold, and the door was closed and bolted behind her. She hurried to the woods, for she knew not where else to go. The wind blew and the snow drifted, but as she reached the bare woods, she saw a light farther on. She hurried toward it, and suddenly she came to a circle of twelve stones. There was a fire in the midst of the circle, and upon each of the twelve stones sat a man clothed all about in a cloak, with a hood drawn down to his eyes. Three of the cloaks were of dazzling white, three were of tender green, three of a golden yellow and three of a rich deep purple. Debranca stopped in astonishment, but she was so cold that after a moment she spoke. Kind sirs, she said, may I come to your fire? I am almost perished with the wind and the cold. An old man with a long white beard who held a staff in his hand answered her. Come and welcome, he said. We are the twelve months of the year, and I am January. Will you tell us who you are, and why you come here alone? I am Debranca, she answered, stretching her hands out to the fire. I am sent here by Zloboga and her mother to gather violets. Violets in January? exclaimed the old man. What notion is this? It is very foolish, I know, replied Debranca. But Zloboga and her mother will beat me if I go back without them. At that, the old man handed his staff to a figure clad in green. This is a matter for you to manage, Brother March, he said. At that, the figure in green arose, took the staff, stirred the fire, and rapped gently upon the ground. Immediately, the air grew warm, the grass sprang up, 
The leaves came forth, and all about in the woods the purple violets blossomed. With a cry of delight, Dobrunka gathered all that her hands could hold of the fragrant flowers, and thanking March prettily, she hastened away. When she reached home, Zloboga and her mother were astonished, but Zloboga pinned the blossoms in her dress and went away to the party. She did not say so much as thank you to Dobrunka. The next day, having stayed out late at the party, Zloboga was more than usually cross and hard to please. Nothing tastes good, she exclaimed as she pushed away her plate. I wish I had a dish of strawberries. Dobrunka, she added, where did you find the violets yesterday? In the woods, replied Dobrunka. They were thick upon the ground. Then go and get me some strawberries, commanded Zloboga. Nothing else will satisfy me. Strawberries in January, exclaimed Dobrunka. There were no strawberries in the woods. I care not, said Zloboga with a stamp of her foot. You must get me a dishful, and come not back till you find them. Once more Dobrunka was pushed out into the cold, and the door was shut and bolted. Frightened and cold, she again made her way to the woods. It was bitterly cold, but when she reached the edge of the woods, she saw again the shining light. She made her way to it, and holding out her hand, she said as before, Kind sirs, may I warm myself at your fire? I am almost perished with cold. Again, January bade her welcome, and asked her what she sought. I am sent for a dish full of strawberries, she said, though it seems but a foolish errand. Strawberries in January, exclaimed the old man, and will you be beaten if you go back without them? Yes, indeed, cried poor Dobrunka, and the door is bolted against me till I bring them. Then January took his staff and handed it to one of the figures clad in a cloak of gold. Brother June, he said, you must manage this. Then June arose, and taking the staff, he stirred the fire till all the air grew warm. Then he tapped upon the ground, and the grass grew green, the leaves burst forth, and the earth was dotted with red, red berries. Oh, oh, exclaimed Debrunka, clasping her hands, how good you are to me! Then she fell upon her knees, and soon she had filled her apron with the ripe fruit. Thanking June in her prettiest manner, she hastened home, and poured the berries out before Zloboga and her mother. Where did you find them? asked Zloboga coldly. And when Dobrunka told her that there were many of them in the woods, she ate them greedily. But not a thank you, did she say to Dobrunka. The next day it was apples that Zloboga wanted, and as before, Dobrunka was sent to fetch them, and the door was bolted. Again she ran to the woods, facing the cold north wind and stumbling through the drifts of snow. But the bright light still shone, and when she reached it, the circle of figures sat about the fire as on the two previous days. May I come again to your fire, kind friends? asked Dobrunka. You are welcome, said January. But what is your errand today? Today I must find apples, said Dobrunka, and I shall be beaten if I bring them not back. Then January handed his staff to a figure clothed in a gown of deep purple, and as he did so he said, Brother September, this is a matter for you to manage. Then September stirred the fire with the staff, and the air grew warm, and trees put forth their leaves, and the apple trees covered themselves with pink blossoms. Then the petals fell, and in their place hung many red-cheeked apples. Shake the tree, Dobrunka, said September, and Dobrunka shook the tree. Two ripe apples fell, and she picked them up, thanked September with a smile, and ran away home. Only two apples, exclaimed Zloboga as she entered. Why did you not bring more? Only two fell when I shook the tree, said Dobrunka. Zloboga and her mother never before had eaten apples of so delicious a flavour. The next morning, Zloboga declared, I am going to the woods today. I want more of those delicious apples. I am going to find the wonderful tree upon which they grow and shake down all its fruit. Let Dobrunka bring them to you, said her mother. But Zloboga was willful, and in spite of the cold and snow, she set out to find the wonderful tree and gather all its fruit. She ran away to the woods, and her mother, fearing that some harm would come to her, followed. But Zloboga did not see the shining light that had guided Dobrunka, and she lost her way in the snow and the cold. Dobrunka wondered and wondered when Zloboga and her mother did not come back, 
and after many days, for no one ever heard of them again, she became mistress of the little cottage, the cow, the garden, and the chickens. And one day a neighbor's son came to her door and asked her to marry him, and they lived in the little cottage and were happy ever afterward. End of section three. Recording by James Pinnegar. Section 4 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Marie Lennon. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. Inger's Loaf. Once upon a time, a little peasant girl named Inger was sent to the home of a rich family in the country to act as serving maid. Now Inger was a very pretty girl, but she was proud and selfish, and this had caused her father and mother a great deal of sorrow. The rich people to whom she was sent were good to little Inger. They dressed her as prettily as they did their own little daughter, and they treated her as kindly as though she too were their own. One would think that this would have caused Inger to be kind and loving, but instead she became more and more proud and selfish. One day, when she'd been away from her home many months, her employer said to her, "'Inger, it is quite time that you visited your father and mother.' So Inger put on her very best shoes and her prettiest dress, and away she started. "'It will be surprised to see how grand I look,' she said to herself as she ran along. When she reached the edge of the village, she saw groups of young men and women walking about and talking, and seated upon a rough stone bench she saw her own mother. On her mother's back rested a bundle of sticks which she had picked up for fuel. What will all those people say to see me talking to an old woman with a bundle of sticks on her back? exclaimed Inger, looking at her own pretty clothes. So without speaking one word to her mother, she turned and ran back to her employer in the country. Many months passed, and then her employer said again, "'Little Inger, it is time you visited your father and mother.' So once more, Inger put on her very best shoes and her prettiest dress, and just as she was about to start, her employer handed her a fine fresh loaf of wheat and bread. "'It is for your father and mother,' she said. "'They will like the fresh sweet loaf.' Now the peasants lived on coarse oat cakes, and fresh wheat and bread was a very great treat." So Inger took the loaf and started on her way. Presently she came to a spot where the ground was soft and wet. Inger stopped and looked down. I shall spoil my pretty shoes if I step in the marsh, she said to herself, and I want to look fine when I reach the village. I know what I will do. I will drop this loaf in the marsh and jump upon it. Then I shall keep my shoes quite clean. But your father and mother would like the wheat and bread, a voice seemed to say. It will be a rare treat to them, and they oftentimes have to go hungry, you know. Inger looked at the loaf, then she looked at the marsh, and last of all she looked at her shoes. I cannot help that, she said. I must save my pretty shoes. With that, she threw the loaf into the marsh and sprang upon it. But when she would have leapt from the loaf to the opposite side of the marsh, she could not. Her feet were held fast by the loaf and in a moment it sank out of sight and pulled little Inger down with it. And where do you suppose Inger found herself? She found herself in the home of the old Marsh Wife, who was half-sister to the Elf King. Now the Marsh Wife and the Elf King live quite close to Bogeyland, and all sorts of queer things happen in that part of the world. But poor Inger was in a sad plight for visiting strange countries. The mud of the marsh had soiled her pretty shoes, her fine dress, and even her face and her hair. "'What a dirty-looking child!' exclaimed an old woman, who sat in the marshwife's kitchen. Inger gazed at the old woman, and she did not like her. The old woman was working very fast at the strangest piece of embroidery, was made entirely of lies, which she wove with rapid fingers. By her side were piled a heap of necklaces. These were made from idle words, which she had picked up and strung together. She loved to give these necklaces away, for they always caused the wearers no end of trouble. On the other side of the old woman lay a pile of slippers. She had made them from gadabout leather, and these, too, she loved to give away, 
for the wares of them could find no rest. Indeed, she was a very wicked old woman, and Inger began to tremble as she looked at her. Presently, the old woman put down her embroidery and looked at Inger through a pair of very big eyeglasses. It seemed to Inger that with those eyeglasses the old woman could see right into her heart. Yes, said the old woman at last. She will make a good statue for my court. May I have her? You are quite welcome to her, replied the marsh wife. I do not know why she came here. What is it that she stands upon? It looks like a wheaten loaf, said the old woman. And she was quite right, for Inger's feet were still fast to the loaf, and neither one of them could she move. A statue, said Inger to herself. Statues are beautiful. I suppose she wants me because I am pretty. But no sooner had she thought this than she remembered that she was covered with mud and that the old woman had called her a dirty child. But she had no more time in which to wonder, for the old woman had already gathered up her work and was whisking her away to Bogeyland, for that was where the old woman lived. The next that Inger knew, she was standing, still on her wheaten loaf, in a great court among many other statues, for she was now a statue herself. She could think, and she could turn her eyes and look about, but aside from this, she was as stiff as a stone. The statues about her were not pretty, but they were quite as pretty as poor Inger in her covering of brown mud. Now Inger had plenty of time to think, for she could not run about or talk or play. She could only stand in the old woman's court in Bogeyland. At first she thought only about herself, and of how unhappy she was, but she could not shed a tear, no matter how wretched she felt. She watched the old woman at her work, and she thought of all the unhappiness and trouble she was making for other people. She saw her fashioning her gifts, embroideries of lies and necklaces of idle words and slippers of gadabout leather, and she thought what a wicked woman she was. Then she wondered how all the other statues came to be in the old woman's garden, and if they were as unhappy as she. But after a while, Inger did not give so much time to these unpleasant thoughts. She began to think instead about her father and mother and her kind employer. She remembered how good they had always been to her. Then she remembered how she had turned away from her mother when she had a bundle of sticks upon her back, and how she had thrown the wheat and loaf into the marsh when her father and mother had perhaps been hungry. All at once she exclaimed within herself, Why, I am just as bad as this old woman. I was so vain and selfish that I made everyone else unhappy, for I tried only to please myself. The more Inger thought about this, the sorrier she grew, and at last she said, Oh, if I could only give so much as a wheaten loaf to someone, how happy I should be! Then something very strange happened. The stiff statue which had been Inger seemed all at once to melt, and away from it there flew a sober little brown bird, and the bird winged its way to the upper air. It was a very quiet, timid little bird, and it could not sing, but it crept into a crevice in a wall and watched the other birds about it. It was winter, and the waters were frozen, and the fields were covered with snow, so the birds could find but little to eat. But on Christmas Day, our little brown bird saw the people of the village tie a sheaf of grain to a pole. Then they raised the pole upright, and went away and left it. And oh, how the birds flocked around and ate the grain, for that was just what the people had wished. The little brown bird hopped out with the rest and ate a kernel of wheat. Then a happy thought came to it, and away it flew. It flew along the roads, where loads of grain had jolted. It lighted outside kitchen windows where crumbs were thrown, and everywhere that it went it ate just one kernel or one crumb, and it called the other birds to come and take all the rest. Here and there the little brown bird flew, hunting for food and calling the other birds whenever it found a bit to eat. It was a very happy bird. Its only sorrow was that it could not sing. But one day, when it had divided a single crumb with a tiny wren, the little brown bird heard a voice say, Little brown bird, you have given away enough crumbs and seeds to make a whole wheat and loaf. At that, the little brown bird felt something throbbing in its throat, and the next moment it was pouring forth a beautiful song of thanksgiving. 
a song so sweet and pure and clear that the children playing in a nearby yard stopped to listen. And as they looked, the bird lifted its wings, and it was all pure white, and it flew happily away into the sky. End of section four. Section five of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Marie Lennon. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. Old Shut Eyes and His Dream Umbrella. Night is drawing on and little Hylmar is sitting quietly by the fireside on a little footstool. Now Hylmar does not hear a single footfall, but just the same, someone is coming up the stairs. Someone in a coat of silk that shimmers all red and blue and green. It is old Shut Eyes, the wonderful teller of dreams. He has taken off his shoes so he will not be heard, and he opens the door so that not a sound reaches Hylmar's ears. Puff! Before Hylmer can raise his eyes to look, Old Shut Eyes has sent into them an invisible spray, and then Hylmer's lids close, his head droops, and he is carried off to bed. But Old Shut Eyes steals softly in after him and sits down beside his bed. Hylmer has been a good boy all day, so Old takes from under his arm a beautiful umbrella all covered with pictures, and he raises it over Hylmer's bed. Old Shut Eyes carries two kinds of umbrellas. One is for naughty children, and it has no beautiful pictures at all, and then there are no beautiful dreams. But Hylmer's umbrella has wonderful pictures, and Ole begins at once to tell him about them. First, said Old Shut Eyes, I am going to make things smart. As he said this, the plants in the pots in Hylmer's room stretched up into trees. The branches blossomed forth with wonderful roses, and all the room looked like a lovely arbor. There was fruit on the trees, too, and it tasted like the richest jam, and the vines were covered with buns, just bursting with plums. Oh, it was delightful. But in the midst of all these wonders, there came a noise of grumbling, and it came from a drawer in the table. It was the drawer in which Hylmer kept his school books and slate. Old Shut Eyes opened the drawer, the slate was twisting itself into the most wretched shapes. "'What is all this?' exclaimed Ole. "'Oh, I am in great misery,' said the slate. "'There is a wrong figure in one of my sums, and try as I may, I cannot change it.' The little pencil tied to the slate by a bit of string was tugging with all its might. "'I would change the figure if I could,' it cried in a creaky voice. "'But I can't.' At that, the copy-book began to lament. Ole turned the leaves. He saw a nice stiff row of capital letters and a nice stiff row of little letters. These were the letters that were printed in the book. But beyond these were other letters that Hylmer had made. They leaned this way and they leaned that way, and some of them were almost tumbling off the line on which they were supposed to stand. Ole Shut Eyes looked closely at them. He could see that Hylmer had tried to make them like the copy, but his small fingers could not make the lines go where they should. We would like to be stiff and straight, wailed the letters, but we are so crooked we can't stand up. Dear me, said Old Shut Eyes, I shall have to give you a dose of medicine. Oh, oh, no, no, cried all the letters together, and they stood up as stiff as anything. Now I will drill you like soldiers, said Ole. One, two, one, two, one, two. Oh, how stiff they stood as they marched up and down the page. But I must tell you that the next morning, when Hylmer awoke and opened his copy book, they were just as crooked as ever, and the sum hadn't come right either. The next thing that Old Shut Eyes did was to touch a picture that was upon the wall, and the painted birds in the trees began to fly about and sing. The grass and flowers nodded in the breeze, and the river began flowing toward the sea. Hylmer put his foot up into the picture, and there he stood under the trees, before him on the water was a little boat, painted red and blue, and it had silver sails. Hylmer stepped into it, and away it sailed down the stream. Pretty fishes splashed about in the water and swam after the red and blue boat. 
The fishes had scales of silver and gold. Birds sang to Hylmer as he passed through deep woods, and the trees told him stories, dark stories about robbers and witches. Then the little boat sailed past an open space where there was a neat cottage. A young woman came out of the cottage and sang a song to him, and she was the woman who had been Hylmer's nurse, and the song she sang was one she had sung to him many, many times before when she had held him in her arms. As the song died away, the woman and the boat both seemed to vanish. The next that Hylmer knew, old Shut Eyes was introducing him to a little gray mouse that was on her way to a wedding. Two of the mice who live beneath your mother's pantry floor are to be married tonight, said the mouse politely. Would you like to attend the wedding? Very much, said Hylmer. But how am I to get there? I'm too big to go through a mouse hole. Leave that to me, said old Shut Eyes, and in a twinkling Hylmer found himself even smaller than a mouse. He hastily put on his tin soldier's uniform, which fitted perfectly and was very grand. Now step into this thimble of your mother's said the mouse. I will make an excellent carriage, and I will draw you to the wedding. So Hylmer seated himself in the thimble, and was driven away to the wedding. Perhaps the thimble carriage was a teeny bit small. At any rate, Hylmer turned over in his bed and muttered, Are there any more stories? There's no more time for stories, said Ole. Tomorrow is Sunday, and I must get the world all polished up. First of all, I must see that the brownies up in the church tower are burnishing the bells. They must ring clear and true to call the people to worship. I must see that the breezes have brushed the dust from the grass and flowers. They must be fresh and sweet. Those things are easily attended to, said Ole. But it isn't so easy to polish the stars. You see, he continued, first of all, I have to get them down and take them in my apron to polish them. But it doesn't do to be careless. No, indeed. I must number each star and each star hole so that I can put them back in their proper places. If I didn't do that, they would not stick, and we should have too many falling stars. At that, the picture of Hylmer's great-grandfather, which hung upon the wall of the room, spoke. Now, I say, Mr. Shut-Eyes, it said, I am quite willing that you should tell Hylmer stories, but really, you must not puzzle his brains with such stories as this. The stars cannot be taken down to be polished, you know. They are planets, like our Earth. But old Shut Eyes smiled wisely. Thank you, great grandfather, he said, but I am much older than you, and I know many things which you would not believe. However, he added, if you do not approve of my stories, you may tell some yourself. And with that, old Shut Eyes folded up his dream umbrella and vanished. And Hylmer determined that the next night he would turn great grandfather's picture to the wall. End of section five. Section 6 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. The Nightingale from Anderson. Many long years ago, the Emperor of China made a very great discovery. He was reading in a book, which was a very unusual thing for him to do, and he read the words, But the most wonderful thing in all the empire of China is the song of the nightingale. What is this? cried the emperor. The nightingale in my own empire, and I have never met her? Who is she? I must find her. I must hear her sing. It is strange, he added, that people of other countries know more about my empire than I do myself. Now and then one may really learn something from books. So the emperor summoned a lord-in-waiting and said to him, I have just read about the song of the nightingale, but I do not know her. See that she appears at court this evening. I must hear her sing. The lord-in-waiting bowed very low and hastened away. He never had heard of the nightingale either, and had no idea where she was to be found. But he ran all through the castle, upstairs and down, through corridors and chambers and everywhere he inquired about the nightingale but no one knew who she was or where she could be found the lord-in-waiting bowed low before the emperor and told him this what exclaimed the emperor the song of the nightingale is the most wonderful thing in my kingdom and no one knows who she is 
she must be brought to the court this evening if she is not the whole court shall be trampled upon sing pei cried the lord-in-waiting and again he searched the castle and half the court ran after him for they did not want to be trampled upon at length a simple little kitchen maid heard the uproar and timidly she said i know the nightingale i can show you where she lives indeed i have often heard her sing at that the whole court set out on the heels of the lord-in-waiting and he in turn ran after the little kitchen maid they left the castle passed through the beautiful gardens of the emperor and at last found themselves in the deep green woods none of the court ever had been there before then the little kitchen maid pointed to a small gray bird perched upon the branch of a tree there is the nightingale she said the lord-in-waiting could scarcely recover from his surprise he never had dreamed that the nightingale would prove to be a sober little gray bird but he delivered the emperor's message and bade the little bird appear at court that evening i sing best among the green trees said the nightingale but if the emperor wishes i will come the castle was decorated for the occasion and a wonderful golden cage was made for the nightingale at the appointed time she came and when she sang her song was so clear and pure and sweet that tears formed in the emperor's eyes and ran down upon his cheeks when she had finished the emperor was so pleased that he said she should remain at court she should live in the golden cage and should have many attendants to wait upon her he even offered to hang his golden slipper about her neck but this the nightingale declined she would have been much happier in her home in the green wood but what the emperor commands must be done so she lived at court in a golden cage close beside the emperor's couch and she sang whenever the emperor commanded one day a packet came addressed to the emperor perhaps it is another book said he but when it was opened he found not a book but a most marvellous bird it was made of silver and gold studded with precious jewels and inside the bird were springs and wheels so that when they were wound the bird could sing truly this were a new marvel and when the emperor had heard the jewelled bird sing he cared no more for the true nightingale and she was allowed to fly away to her home in the green woods the jewelled bird was placed in the golden cage and the golden slipper was hung about her neck many times a day the golden bird was wound and made to sing for the emperor it was much grander than a living bird for any one could hear a living bird sing but one morning when the attendant wound the springs there was a sudden whirr the spring had broken the jewelled bird could sing no more it was sent away to be mended but no one in all the emperor's kingdom knew how to repair it a watchmaker did the best that he could but after that it could only be wound once a year and then it had to be done very carefully many many moons passed and then one day it was whispered that the emperor was very ill it was not thought that he could live he lay very still and white on his silken couch and his attendants were frightened and thought him dead so they hastened away to tell the people that the emperor was dead but when they had gone the emperor turned his head toward the little golden bird and whispered music i want music but the little bird could not sing for there was no one there to wind it music you little golden bird whispered the emperor i have loaded you with gifts sing to me now but the jewelled bird could not sing the emperor turned his head what was that at the open window the little gray nightingale had heard that the emperor was ill and she had flown to the window to sing to him and in a moment her sweet clear song filled all the room with melody she sang of life and hope and as she sang the emperor's cheeks grew ruddy and his strength returned the door opened and the attendants came softly in to care for the dead emperor but what was their astonishment when he arose and said good morning end of section six section seven of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow cowles the six swans from grimm once upon a time there were seven children who lived alone in a great castle 
hidden deep in the heart of a forest. Six of the children were boys, the seventh was a girl. Their father was the king who ruled over the country, and he loved his children dearly. But to save his own life, after the death of the queen, their mother, he was forced to marry a woman who was a witch. He knew well that she would not be kind to his children, so he placed them in the castle in the forest and went secretly to visit them as often as he could. But after a time the witch-wife began to wonder who it was that the king went away to see. So she gave a sum of money to one of the servants, and the servant told her about the children of the king, and how she could find her way to the castle in the forest. So, one day, when the king had gone out hunting, the witch-wife followed the secret path through the forest, and when she came near the castle, she made a great tramping, as though a heavy man were walking. The sister, who was busy in the house, did not hear, but the six boys who were outside heard his footsteps, and thinking that it was their father coming, ran down the path to meet him. Then the witch-wife threw over each one a little white shirt, and as soon as the shirts touched them, they were changed into white swans, and they flew away to the water. Now the servant had not told how many children the king had, so the witch-wife supposed that she had changed them all into swans, and she went away home satisfied. But the king's little daughter had looked from the window of the castle, just in time to see her brothers changed into swans, and had watched them fly away. She was quite broken-hearted at the sight, and went sadly about the castle all day. But at evening she heard a fluttering of wings, and suddenly six white swans flew down to the castle and lighted before her. They blew upon one another, and their feathers were stripped off like coats, and her six brothers stood before her in their own forms. One of them spoke quickly. We can remove our coats with swan feathers and resume our own forms for only fifteen minutes, he said. But what can I do to help you? exclaimed their sister, wiping away her tears. Is there no way that I can bring you back to stay? "'The way is too difficult,' answered one of the brothers. "'But tell me,' exclaimed the girl. "'There is but one way,' replied her brother. "'For six years you must let no word of sound fall from your lips, "'and during the six years you must stitch together leaves of the starwort "'and make us six shirts. "'But it is too difficult,' he added. "'You cannot do it.' "'Then, as the fifteen minutes were spent, "'the six brothers resumed the form of swans "'and flew away from the castle. "'I will do it,' said the sister.' and then she closed fast her lips and ran away from the castle. She travelled a long distance till she came to the place where the starwort grew. Then she picked a quantity of leaves and began to sew. Day after day she spent picking the leaves of starwort and sewing them with the finest stitches possible. No word passed her lips, and she neither sang nor laughed. One day, while she was thus occupied, a prince with his retinue passed her as she worked. The prince turned back and spoke, but though the maiden smiled, she shook her head and said no word. The prince was puzzled, but no answer could he get to his questioning. Day after day he came back, for the silent maiden fascinated him, and at last he asked her to marry him. She shook her head and laid her finger on her silent lips, but she smiled as she did so, and the prince became the more determined to make her his bride. Each day he came to see her, and she began to watch for his coming and to count the hours after he had gone. Then, one day, when he again begged her to marry him, she smiled and laid her hand in his. The prince was so happy that he sent at once for a priest, and they were married, and he led her to his father's house. But though she was so happy, the wife did not speak, and each day she sewed on the shirts of starwort. But the queen, the mother of the prince, did not like the choice that he had made, and, as she was a wicked woman, she invented evil stories about his wife and told them to the prince. At last the queen convinced him that his wife was a witch, and, though he still loved her, and it almost broke his heart to do it, he was obliged to consent to the queen's plan that his wife be placed in a dungeon, and left there the remainder of her life. When he told his girl-wife this, she threw her arms about him, and tears rained down her face. But no sound passed her lips. Then they wept together, and although the prince told her that he loved her as well as ever, he said that the king and queen had determined that she must be sent to the dungeon, and he could not alter their plan. With trembling hands, the young wife gathered up the six little shirts of starwort, for she had almost completed the last one. Only a sleeve remained unfinished, for the sixth year was almost past. As they led her out of the castle, there was heard a sudden rush of wings, and six beautiful swans lighted in the path before her for at that moment the sixth year was ended. Instantly she threw over them the six shirts of starwort, and immediately the coats of feathers dropped off, and six handsome young men stood in the path. 
though one of them, on whom the unfinished shirt had fallen, had a swan's wing in place of an arm. Then their sister turned with a glad cry to her husband, the prince, and told him of the enchantment which the witch-wife had thrown over her brothers, and of the penance she had done to break the enchantment. Then the prince took her in his arms, and led her and her brothers back to the castle, where there was great feasting and rejoicing, and the prince loved his wife more dearly than ever. End of section 7 Recording by Esther Camus Section number 8 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles The Enchanted Mead, a Korean folk tale. Once upon a time, there was an old woman lived upon a river bank where the ferry boats crossed. She was poor and often had only a bowl of rice for her dinner. She had no family, unless one may call a faithful dog and a mischievous cat a family. But dog Trophy, Thomas the cat, and the old woman lived very happily and were the best of friends. It was only now and then that they went hungry to bed. One day a stranger stopped at the old woman's cottage. I am weary and thirsty, he said. Can you give me refreshment? Now the old woman had only a bit of bread and one last sup of mead, but seeing the stranger's weariness, she offered them heartily. Thank you, said the stranger, when he had finished. I cannot offer you money, but if you will drop this bit of amber into your jug, you will never find it empty of mead. And handing the old woman a clear, yellow stone, he disappeared. Wondering and curious, the old woman dropped a bit of amber into the jug. At once the jug felt heavy, for it was full of mead. The old woman was delighted, and so plainly did she show her joy, that Dog Trophy and Thomas the Cat seemed to understand her good fortune, and capered about to express their pleasure. Now good times came to the little cottage, for since the jug was always full, yet required no filling. The old woman set up a little shop where travelers, crossing the ferry, could stop for a bit of bread and a sup of mead. The cat and the dog often talked things over at night, and they understood about the magic bit of amber, for not once had they gone to bed supperless, since the stranger had left the curious stone. The jug was always guarded by one of the three. But one day the old woman took up the jug, and it was empty. She shook it. No merry stone tinkled against its side. Then the old woman knew that in pouring the mead for a customer, the bit of amber must have been poured out too. But into whose cup or jug it had gone, she had not the least idea. She was filled with despair. I have no other means of support, she said sadly. Must I go hungry again in my old age? Dog Trophy's lively expression changed to one of deep woe, and his tail dropped dejectedly. Thomas the Cat lost his usually cheerful grin, and lashed his sides with a bristling tail. At night, as usual, they talked matters over. I know, said Thomas, that I could find the bit of stone by the smell, if I could get somewhere near it. But how is one to begin? We will set out, said Dog Trophy, and visit every house in the neighborhood. Let us start at once, while our old mistress sleeps. Ready, said Thomas, and off they went. 
they visited every house on that side the river but not once did thomas get a whiff of the precious amber the river is frozen said trophy at length let us cross to the other side we have spent many nights in searching but we must not give up yet so together they crossed the river for the ice was firm and began their search on the farther side dog trophy made the acquaintance of all the dogs while thomas went inside and called upon the house cats one night as he was walking stealthily along a beam in one of the houses he caught a sniff of the longed-for odor it told him that the stone was near and he was so delighted that he almost lost his hold upon the beam but it was well that he did not for he would have fallen straight upon the bald head of the man who owned the house he regained his balance and followed the scent which grew stronger and stronger the farther he went at last he came to a heavy box the cover of which was fitted so closely that he could not move it try as he would the cover could not be raised so thomas went outside to consult with dog trophy the box cannot be moved and the lid cannot be lifted said thomas but i am sure the stone is inside there is but one thing to do then said dog trophy who was very wise and what is that asked thomas respectfully get the mice to gnaw a hole in the box said trophy at that thomas grinned and how will we win a favor from the mice we who chase and eat them on every occasion let us sign an agreement not to touch a rat or a mouse for a whole year said trophy and that is what they did though they had some trouble in getting a hearing with the mice but it was a very good bargain the mice admitted and so a hole was gnawed in the box and a very small mouse squeezed through and brought out the bit of amber how dog trophy and thomas the cat rejoiced and how glad their mistress would be they hurried down to the river bank but when they reached the river they saw that the ice was gone spring had come while they were carrying on their search there was no way for them to get back except to swim but thomas of course could not swim but dog trophy was never at a loss for a plan get on my back he said and hold that bit of amber in your mouth whatever happens do not lose the amber i will carry you safe across with that he plunged into the water while thomas clung fast to his long hair thomas wanted to laugh at this new way of riding but he dared not for fear he might lose the stone they were almost across when a sudden splash of water flew straight into thomas's face he sneezed when down dropped the precious stone into the river trophy saw it go and dived for it and such a wetting as thomas got but the stone had disappeared thomas got to the bank somehow and ran up a tree to dry his fur then he arched his back and spit at dog trophy for giving him such a ducking while dog trophy barked furiously up the tree at thomas for losing the precious stone when he had barked his throat quite raw dog trophy went sadly down to the river bank a man was standing near fishing presently the fisherman drew out a large fish and thoughtlessly threw it upon the bank a familiar scent greeted dog trophy's nostrils and instantly he caught up the fish and dashed away with it to his mistress the old woman was glad indeed to see her faithful dog and glad also of a good meal of fish but when she opened the fish to dress it what do you suppose she found her precious bit of amber lay in the stomach of the fish there was happiness and plenty in the little cottage once more but dog trophy and thomas the cat have never been good friends since
End of Section 8 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 9 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles The White Cat from Dolnoy Once upon a time, many years ago, a little girl was given by her mother to the fairies and they were to bring her up the fairies were good to her and she was very happy she grew up and was accomplished and very beautiful she was a princess for her father was a king and her mother was a queen but one day the princess disobeyed the fairies and made them very angry with her so for a punishment they changed her into a beautiful white cat they gave her a palace to live in a most wonderful palace which was lighted by the sparkling of hundreds of precious jewels and a retinue of servants to wait upon her but each servant like herself had been changed into the form of a cat one day there came to the palace a young man a prince who had been sent away from home on a strange errand his father who was king of a distant country had sent him out to find the most remarkable dog in all the world the prince had travelled far when he saw the beautiful palace with walls of glass having all the tints of the rainbow doors of gold and lights formed by dazzling sapphires rubies and emeralds never had the prince seen so marvellous a building and he rang a bell at the entrance wondering as he did so who could it be that lived in the midst of such luxury and beauty what was his surprise then upon being admitted to the palace to discover that all the inmates were cats but never had he been treated with greater hospitality a beautiful room was placed at his disposal a bath of perfumed water was prepared and later a dinner of the richest foods was set before him he noticed however that two plates were laid at the table and he wondered with whom he was to dine but while he wondered a beautiful white cat came gracefully into the room and took her seat at the table prince she said addressing him i hope my servants have made you comfortable while we eat will you tell me from what country you come and something of your journey the prince was filled with amazement but he was careful not to show his surprise he told her of the strange errand upon which he had been sent by his father the king i have a year in which to find the most remarkable dog in the world he added make yourself comfortable here as long as you like said the white cat graciously perhaps you may find the dog you are in search of near by the prince thanked her for he was charmed by her gracious manner and filled also with curiosity he lingered at the palace day after day for it was the most wonderful and the most beautiful place that he had ever seen and each day he wondered more and more at the charm and good breeding of the white cat and at her many accomplishments but one morning the thought came suddenly to him that he had but three days more in which to find the most remarkable dog in the world and return with it to his father's castle he was filled with remorse at having lingered so long do not regret your stay said the white cat i have found for you the most remarkable dog in the world and you shall take it to your father with that she handed him an acorn the prince in wonder held the acorn to his ear and to his joy and amazement heard within it the faint barking of a dog bidding the white cat farewell he hastened to the king and in his presence opened the acorn out jumped the tiniest and most perfect little dog imaginable it could easily jump through a lady's finger ring the king was delighted and wanted all his court to see the wonderful dog but a few days later he again called his son to him and said my son i must have a piece of muslin fine enough to be drawn through the eye of a needle you i am sure can find it for me you may have a year in which to secure it the prince was rather glad of another opportunity to travel for of course he went directly to the palace of the white cat and to her he told his second quest have no fear said she my servants can produce the muslin for you 
and we shall be glad to entertain you until it is time for you to return to your father so for another year the prince remained in the palace of the white cat enjoying the beauty and comfort of its wonderful gardens its baths and its works of art but most of all the prince enjoyed the company of the white cat whom he found more intelligent more witty and more charming in manner than any lady of his father's court at the end of the second year the white cat came to him and placing in his hand an apple seed said you must return now to your father's castle open the seed in his presence for it contains the object of your search but how can i leave you my good friend said the prince sorrowfully and how can i ever repay you you may be sent upon a third quest said the white cat in a soft voice to have you return will fully repay me so the prince rode away to his father and when he reached the castle and opened the apple seed he drew forth four hundred yards of muslin so fine that it could easily be drawn through the eye of the finest needle the king was delighted and filled with wonder but yet he was not satisfied you must go upon one more quest my son he said and then if you are successful i will give you my kingdom and you shall rule in my stead bring back with you at the end of a year the most beautiful princess in all the world and the kingdom shall be yours so once more the prince set out straight to the palace of the white cat but this time he was sad as he repeated his father's words have no fear said the white cat all will be well at the end of the year but never did a year pass so quickly as this one there were feasts and music fireworks and a thousand entertainments provided by the attendants of the white cat it lacked but a few days of time for the prince's return when he exclaimed sorrowfully i would rather stay with you dear white cat than marry the most beautiful princess in the world and rule over my father's kingdom become a mortal for my sake or use some magic to turn me also into a cat at the words a sudden flash blinded the prince and when he again looked there stood before him not the white cat but a girl of radiant beauty with a dazzling smile she cried you have broken by your words the spell which the fairies threw over me i am indeed a princess but when i angered the fairies they changed me into the form of a white cat as she spoke her attendants who had also been changed back to their human forms came into the room and they made the princess ready and she went with the happy prince to the castle of his father the king where they were married and lived happily ever after End of section 9section ten of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow cowles the miller's daughter a slav folk tale once upon a time there was born to a rich nobleman a beautiful baby boy and there was great rejoicing and feasting in the castle when the nobleman's friends came together for the christening the fairies came too each fairy brought a gift but one of them was in a bad humour and when it was her turn to bestow her gift she said your son shall grow to manhood only upon one condition his feet must not touch the floor before he is twelve years of age the nobleman was greatly distressed at this but it could not be altered so he had a cradle made of gold with high sides and he hired the most careful nurses in all the country around to wait upon and watch his boy and the boy grew and was strong and sturdy and every one about the castle loved him and watched over him carefully at last his twelfth birthday drew near and his father ordered a splendid feast there was a great bustle of preparation while every one rejoiced but in the midst of this happiness and confusion there came a sudden noise of grief and crying and the walls of the castle began to tremble and shake at this the attendant who was with the boy became quite frantic with fear she jumped to her feet to see what all this could mean and the boy fell to the floor instantly the cries ceased the walls of the castle stood firm as before but the nobleman's son could not be found 
search was made everywhere but no trace of him was left the nobleman offered a reward of three hundred crowns in gold to any one who could bring him news of his son but no one came to claim the reward then the nobleman shut himself up in his castle his gardens were neglected and all his joys seemed gone now at a little distance from the nobleman's castle there lived a miller with his wife and three daughters one day the eldest daughter went for a walk in the woods she grew very tired and was wishing for a place to rest when close beside her path she saw a neglected summer-house that belonged to the estate of the nobleman she pushed aside the vines and bushes and as she did she discovered fastened to the door of the summer-house a notice long yellowed by the sun and rain it was the offer of three hundred crowns in gold for news of the nobleman's son i wish i might earn the reward said the girl it would make me a fine dowry and then i could marry well she pushed open the door and what was her surprise to see a fire laid ready to light a table set with dainty food and a couch draped with fine tapestries over the fireplace some letters were carved which read of comforts here partake but of thy speech beware of comforts here partake she repeated then i may rest and eat she sat down to taste the food but as she did so there came a sound of sighing and crying she was frightened but when she turned toward the door a young man stood before her for whom are the fire and the food and the couch asked he for myself answered the girl proudly as she said this the young man looked troubled then as suddenly as he had come he was gone when the girl turned again the fire the table and the couch had vanished as completely as the young man had done she returned home but she said nothing to her sisters about her adventure a few days later the second daughter took a walk through the woods and she too becoming weary chanced upon the same summer-house the notice was still upon the door and as she read it she said i wish that i might gain the reward i could dress well all the rest of my life upon three hundred gold crowns and i should have rich friends she pushed open the door and to her surprise found a fire laid ready to light a table spread with dainty food and a richly draped couch and over the fireplace she read the words of comforts here partake but of thy speech beware she was very hungry and as she was used to plain and simple fare she sat down at once at the daintily laid table but before a mouthful of food had touched her lips she heard sighs and a sound of weeping springing up she faced a young man who said to her for whom is the fire laid for myself answered the girl for whom is the table spread he asked for myself she answered again and for whom is the couch prepared he asked again for myself was the reply the young man sighed looked troubled then vanished from sight and when the girl turned back nothing was to be seen of the fire the daintily set table or the couch but neither did she say anything at home of the strange adventure several days passed and then the youngest daughter went for a walk in the woods she too chanced upon the summer-house as her sisters had done i wish i might win the reward she said as she read the weather-stained notice upon the door father should have a new wheel for his mill and mother should have a silk gown she pushed open the door and saw to her surprise the fire the table and the couch then she read the words of comforts here partake but of thy speech beware why these are for me then she said and one should always be careful of his speech she lighted the fire and sat down at the table but as she did so she heard a sound of sighing and crying she turned about and there stood a young man for whom is the fire he asked looking troubled you are welcome to warm yourself by it said the girl and for whom is the table prepared for you if you are hungry she replied and for whom is the couch made ready he questioned again for you if you are weary she answered once more at that the young man's face lighted with joy ah he cried i am the lost son of the nobleman in the great castle the fairy threw a spell over me and i could not return to my father until some mortal showed me a kindness you have done so come he took the miller's youngest daughter by the hand and led her to his father the nobleman was happy beyond words 
the miller had his new mill wheel the miller's wife had a new silk gown the nobleman's son took the miller's youngest daughter for his bride and they all lived happily ever after end of section ten section eleven of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow cowles the beauty and the beast from villeneuve once upon a time there was a rich merchant who had three daughters the youngest was called beauty because she was so kind and lovable and pretty but two older daughters were proud and selfish one day the merchant received a letter which called him away from home when he left he asked each of his daughters what he should bring her when he returned the eldest asked for a necklace of pearls the second wanted a dress of silk embroidered in gold but beauty gave her father a kiss and said i think i should like best of all a bunch of beautiful roses the merchant reached the city and there he received bad news his ships had been lost in a storm and all his wealth had vanished he returned homeward sad and discouraged i must now move into the little cottage on the farm which i own he said to himself for i have lost everything else beauty will not mind he added she will keep the cottage neat and love me as much as ever but my two older daughters will be cross and unhappy woe is me that i have lost my wealth as he went on with these sorrowful thoughts for company he looked up and saw before him a light he was weary and hungry so he followed the light and was amazed to come upon a beautiful palace set in the midst of the forest but no one answered when he knocked and at last he made bow to enter he went from room to room but no one appeared at last he came to a room in which there was a table richly spread for but a single person surely this is a fairy palace he exclaimed and he sat down to eat when he had finished he looked further and found a bed all prepared as though ready for a guest so he thankfully undressed and had a night's sound sleep in the morning he searched again for the owner of the palace but finding no one he ate the breakfast which was bountifully set out and then he prepared to leave as he walked through an arbor upon which hung the most beautiful roses he ever had seen he suddenly remembered beauty's request i cannot take home a necklace of pearls or a gold embroidered gown he said sadly but i can take a bunch of roses to beauty with that he reached up and broke off a full cluster but at the same instant he heard a terrible roar and in the path before him there appeared a most hideous beast i gave you food and lodging said the beast but i allow no one to touch my roses the penalty for breaking them is death the frightened merchant fell upon his knees and pleaded with the beast he told him about beauty and that it was only for her sake that he had broken off the beautiful flowers very well said the beast i will let you go home on one condition you must promise to return in a week's time if one of your daughters chooses to come in your place then you may go free the poor merchant promised faithfully to return and hastened away he was glad that he could see his daughters once more 
before he could be slain by the terrible beast but he was sad at heart as he journeyed toward his home upon reaching there he told his daughters how he had lost his wealth and that they must move into the little cottage on the farm then handing the bunch of roses to beauty he told them the story of the beast and of his promise to return the older daughters bemoaned the loss of the, all their father's wealth and blamed beauty for the added trouble her roses had brought upon them all but beauty threw her arms about her father's neck and said i shall go in in your place dear father no no he cried but beauty could not be turned from her purpose and when at the end of the week her father started for the palace of the beast beauty went by his side did you come off your own accord asked the beast in a terrible voice when he saw her yes replied beauty turning pale and trembling for the beast was very ugly to look upon but when beauty went through the palace she found that the most beautiful rooms of all were marked beauty's rooms and she said to her father perhaps the beast will not kill me after all why should these rooms be made ready for me if i am not to live here so her father went back home somewhat comforted that evening when beauty's supper was made ready the beast came to eat with her beauty trembled and could scarcely swallow a mouthful though the food was the finest and best she ever had tasted do you think me very ugly beauty asked the beast yes replied beauty but you may be very kind will you marry me beauty asked the beast oh no said beauty with a shudder i could not do that everything possible was done at the palace to make beauty comfortable and happy but every evening the beast came to eat with her and every evening he asked her the same question beauty will you marry me and every evening beauty answered no but the beast was so kind and good to her that beauty did not think so much now about how ugly he looked and she began to feel sorry for him he looked so sad when she answered no the beast had placed a magic mirror in beauty's room and when she looked in it she had only to wish and she could see whatever she desired one day she said to herself i wish i could see what they are doing at home and how my father is then she looked in her magic mirror and there she saw her father lying ill in the little farm cottage while her sister sat by looking cross and sulky and the room was in dreadful disorder oh dear beast she exclaimed when he came in to supper that night my father is ill at home for he fears that i am dead he needs me may i not go to him and comfort him will you come back to me beauty asked the beast i cannot live without you beauty readily promised that she would come back in a week then the beast slipped a ring upon her finger and said you have only to turn the ring three times on your finger and wish and you will be at home turn it again three times and wish when you are ready to return but remember he added that if you do not return when you promise i shall die so beauty promised again thanked the beast and turning her ring found herself at once in her father's cottage how thankful her father was to see her alive it made him quite well at once then beauty although she was dressed in the beautiful garments which the beast had given her went about setting the cottage to rights 
while her sisters plied her with all sorts of questions about the beast his palace and the wonderful gifts that he showered upon her they were quite ill-natured and envious but beauty was light-hearted and merry and her father wondered how he ever could let her leave him again in fact there was so much work to be done to make things comfortable and her father and sisters pled so hard for her to remain that beauty stayed on until she had been gone ten days then at night she had a dream and in her dream she saw the beast lying in his bower of roses ill and suffering she wakened and filled with unhappiness she turned her ring three times and wished herself back at once she found herself in the bower kneeling beside the beast oh dear beast she exclaimed have i killed you by my thoughtlessness when you have been so good and kind to me the beast opened his eyes i should have died without you he said beauty will you marry me yes dear beast said beauty for i have learned to love you for your goodness and kindness instantly the covering of fur fell from the beast and he arose and stood before her no longer a beast but a handsome prince clothed in garments of silver for beauty's words had broken his enchantment so they were married and lived happily ever after End of section 11Section 12 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. The Tortoise Shell Cat from Grimm. Once upon a time, there was a miller who lived all alone at his mill except for three apprentices he had neither wife nor child and he was growing old i shall not be long for this world he said to himself and i must leave my mill to one of my apprentices but which one shall it be then the old miller fell a-thinking he was very fond of horses at least he was sure he would be fond of them for he admired them very much though he had never owned one at last he cried i know what i will do i want a fine horse the most of anything i can think of i will send out my three apprentices and the one who brings me back the finest horse shall have my mill and all else that i leave in the world so he called the three apprentices to him and told them all that was in his mind now go he cried and see who shall bring me the finest horse so early next morning the three apprentices started out now one of them named hans was smaller and younger than the others and the two older ones said what can he do one of us will be sure to win when night came on they were weary with travelling and they lay down to sleep in a wood early in the morning the two older apprentices wakened let us steal away and leave hans said one of them he will only hinder us in our search and as the other agreed they stole quietly away leaving hans fast asleep in the woods the sun was shining when hans wakened he rubbed his eyes and looked about then he shouted but no trace could he find of the two who had gone alas what shall i do cried hans i do not know the way of the woods are you in trouble asked a voice close beside him hans started in surprise for the speaker was none other than a beautiful tortoise-shell cat yes replied hans as soon as he could speak for amazement i have been left here alone in the woods and i do not know my way ah i see said the cat pleasantly but do not be alarmed you set out in search of a horse and you shall find one if you do as i bid you hans was more than ever amazed at this speech but he knew at once that this must be an enchanted cat i shall be glad to do as you bid me he said very well answered the cat you are to serve me well and faithfully as i require 
and in the end i will give you a handsomer horse than any you have ever seen so hans went gladly with the cat and soon they came to a great castle this is where i dwell said the cat simply two servants in livery came out to meet them and they too were cats as were all the attendants and inhabitants of the castle after hans entered the palace he was waited upon by cats his meals were served by cats his room was cared for by cats but never before had hans lived upon such fine fare amid such beautiful surroundings upon the first day of his stay at the castle the tortoise-shell cat presented him with a silver hatchet this is for chopping wood she said you are to go into the forest each day and chop enough wood to keep the castle warm what a task thought hans but he said nothing and when he reached the forest he began to swing his silver hatchet what was his surprise to find that a tree fell with every blow for it was an enchanted hatchet and in a short time he had wood enough to fill all the fireplaces in the castle and some to spare soon after this he was given another task he was to cut the grass in the meadows adjoining the castle so that the horses in the stables might have hay for this task he was given a scythe of silver and a whetstone of gold the scythe like the hatchet was enchanted and hans task was completed before he would have believed it possible hans evenings were spent in visiting with the tortoise-shell cat and they became very good friends indeed for she was kind and intelligent and accomplished the other cats furnished entertainment and the days went by quickly one morning the tortoise-shell cat said to hans i want a new castle it will be a small castle but it is to be made of silver and gold and you must build it for me i cried hans thinking that now an impossible task had been set before him but the tortoise-shell cat showed him all the material for the castle such as beams and joists and frames and they were all of silver and gold and when hans began building he found that all the parts fitted perfectly and the golden spikes were driven in with one blow of his hammer when the castle was completed hans addressed the tortoise-shell cat and said i have finished the three tasks you set me now i would like to receive the horse i have earned that i may take him to my master so the tortoise-shell cat led the way to her stables and there were twelve horses each one handsomer than any that hans had ever seen hans was almost overcome between joy and fear could it be possible that one of these horses was to be the reward for his labor then the tortoise-shell cat spoke go back to your master she said i will have two of my servants show you the way see what the other two apprentices have brought but do not be discouraged in three days i will send your horse to you do not fear so hans left the castle and made his way back on foot to the mill the two cats in livery showing him the way though he was dressed in the old clothes he had worn when he reached the castle in the meantime the two older apprentices had returned see master the first one said i have brought you a horse as you wished it was the very best i could find i hope it will please you then the miller looked at the horse and he said how is this the horse is blind did you think to cheat me just then the second apprentice appeared leading a horse and he too said see master i have brought you a horse as you wished it was the very best that i could find i hope it will please you then the miller looked at the horse and he said how is this the horse is lame did you think to cheat me but he had hardly finished speaking when hans came walking down the road with no horse at all then they all cried how is this hans where is your horse my horse will follow me in three days said hans for he was sure he could trust the tortoise-shell cat but the other apprentices laughed and the miller sent him to the goose house to sleep the apprentices returned to their work and the miller was puzzling his brains to know who should have the mill when they all heard music and looking out they saw a royal procession coming from the direction of the forest first of all came a man in rich livery leading a beautiful black horse that stepped daintily and held his head high after that came a golden carriage drawn by eight other fine horses and in the carriage sat a princess of wonderful beauty and the princess was no other than the tortoise-shell cat 
who had been changed back to her own form after hans had performed the tasks she had given him to do after the carriage of the princess came a long retinue of servants the procession stopped and the princess spoke to the miller here she said is the horse which hans earned by his faithful work is it as fine as those which your other apprentices brought at that the two older apprentices hung their heads in shame the horse is yours she continued but as for hans i want him to spend the rest of his days at my castle where he proved his kindness and worth then the princess had hans clothed in beautiful garments such as a prince might wear and she took him up in the carriage beside her and drove away and hans lived happily in the castle with the princess ever after end of section twelve section thirteen of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow cowles the healing water from grimm there once was a king who was very ill and nothing whatever could be found to cure him now the king had three sons who looked so much alike that people who had seen them but a few times could not tell one from the others one evening as the three sons walked sorrowfully in the palace gardens they met a little man who said to them you grieve because your father the king is ill i know what will cure him if one of you will go to the enchanted castle in faraway land and dip from its fountain a chalice of its healing water your father shall drink it and live but continued the little man i cannot tell you the way to the castle that is for you to find out but i warn you tis a dangerous journey with that the little man bowed and vanished i will go said the eldest son it is my right so he ordered the finest horse in all his father's stables and set out to find the enchanted castle and the fountain of healing water he had gone but a short distance when he met a dwarf in the road what is your errand asked the dwarf doffing his cap politely tis my own affair replied the eldest son haughtily as he rode by aha said the dwarf when he had passed haughty people ask no help and they receive none the eldest son rode on and the path he took led him between two mountains and presently he found himself wedged in between walls of rock he could go neither forward nor backward nor could he turn around and there he stuck for the dwarf whom he had needlessly slighted had willed it so a long time passed and when the eldest son did not return the second son said i fear some evil has befallen our eldest brother but our father the king must have the healing water i will set out to seek it so he chose the best horse in all his father's stables and set forth to find the enchanted castle and the fountain of healing water in far away land but it happened to him as it had to the eldest brother for he too met the dwarf who asked him what is your errand and he answered quite as haughtily as his brother had done tis my own affair then he rode on into the mountains and became wedged between two walls of rock so that he could not go forward nor backward nor could he turn around and there he stuck for the dwarf had willed it so after a time when the second son did not return the youngest son said surely some evil has befallen my brother but my father must have the healing water so he too set out to seek it when he had gone a little way he met the dwarf who asked him what is your errand the youngest son whose name was otto stopped and answered respectfully my father the king is ill i seek the enchanted castle in far away land wherein is the fountain of healing water then the dwarf said since you have answered me respectfully i will help you so he told prince otto how to find the way to the castle and he gave him a rod and two wheaten loaves the gates of the castle are of heavy iron he said and guarded by two fierce lions but if you knock upon the gates with this rod they will open and if you throw a wheaten loaf to each lion they will not attack you you will find the fountain in the court of the castle 
dip from it a chalice of water and hasten away when the clock strikes twelve the iron gates will close again then prince otto thanked the dwarf for his help took the rod and the bread and rode away and it turned out just as the dwarf had told him he reached the castle gate safely and struck them with his rod they opened and the two lions ceased roaring and ate the bread that he threw to them then he made his way into the broad and beautiful court there he saw a wonderful fountain of silver and the water fell from it in a silver spray beside the fountain stood a lovely princess who smiled upon the prince and told him he was welcome to fill his chalice at the fountain so he filled it gladly but instead of hastening away as the dwarf had warned him he lingered to speak to the lovely princess and as he talked with her he forgot the lions and the iron gates till suddenly he heard a distant clock striking the quarter before twelve then he hastened away but not until the princess had given him a kiss and promised to marry him at the end of a year as prince otto ran toward the heavy gates they began to move and as they closed they clipped off a bit of the prince's heel but he held close the chalice of healing water and he had the princess's promise to marry him so the hurt of his heel mattered little then prince otto rode away but he had not gone far when he met the dwarf how did you fare asked the little man i have filled the chalice said the prince and i thank you for your aid but tell me he added where may i find my brothers my father will grieve if they do not return they are haughty men said the dwarf and they will be jealous of you for finding the healing water you will fare better without them but my father the king will grieve sorely if they do not return and i wish to find them so the dwarf directed prince otto to the mountains where his two elder brothers were held fast and he rode rapidly and released them and they went back with him to their father's palace on the way prince otto told them all about his adventures and showed them the chalice of healing water he also told them of the lovely princess and of her promise to marry him at the end of the year but the two elder brothers were jealous as the dwarfs had said they would be and though they pretended to feel glad they really were filled with envy and with angry thoughts after a long journey they reached their father's palace then there was great rejoicing for the king drank of the healing water and became well and strong once more and all the people were glad and praised prince otto this caused the elder brothers to become more jealous than ever and though they said nothing to each other about it they both resolved to win the princess away from their younger brother now as the end of the year drew near the princess ordered that the approach to her castle be paved with pure gold and this was done and the year was up on the day after the pavement was finished then the princess said to her servants whoever rides straight up the golden pavement and asks for me admit but none other not long after a horseman came riding swiftly he looked like the prince who had filled his chalice at the fountain of healing water it was the eldest brother of prince otto when he saw the golden pavement he checked his horse that is only for the feet of the princess he said and riding to the left he approached the castle and asked for the maiden but the servants sent him away as the princess had commanded a little later another horseman came riding swiftly he also looked like the prince who had filled his chalice at the fountain of healing water when he saw the golden pavement he turned to the right saying i will not tread the princess's gold underfoot i would put it to better use this was the next older brother of prince otto and he reached the palace and asked for the princess but the servants sent him away as the princess had commanded soon after a third horseman who looked exactly like the prince who had filled his chalice at the fountain of healing water came riding swiftly and this was prince otto himself and he was so eager to see once more the beautiful princess who had won his love that his eyes looked straight ahead and he did not even notice the pavement of gold and he rode straight up the golden pavement and asked for the princess and the servants threw wide the doors and the princess came forth to greet him so they were married as the princess had promised and they lived in great contentment ever after end of section thirteen section fourteen of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by betty b favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow cowles the lad who wondered from descent once many years ago a man who was very poor had three sons whose names were peter paul and john and he sent them out into the world to seek their fortune peter and paul the two older sons took matters very much as they came and spent but little thought upon them but john the youngest son who was called jack was always wondering about this and investigating that and trying to find out the reason for things the older brothers made fun of this habit of his but this did not trouble jack at all what good does it do you to run after this and that they asked him oh i have the fun of finding out about things answered the youngest brother with a laugh they had not gone far on their travels when they met a servant of the king's household who stopped to exchange a bit of gossip what is the news of the day asked the brothers the king is greatly troubled replied the servant he wants the great oak that grows by the palace cut down but no one can be found who can hew it as fast as a chip is hewed out two grow in its place so instead of getting rid of the tree he finds it growing larger and larger is that all the king's trouble asked jack thinking that even a king might find matters worse than this to trouble him no that is not all said the servant the palace is built upon high ground and there is no well of water near the king wants a well dug near the castle and no one can be found to dig it for all strike solid rock as soon as they begin and what will the king give to one who hews the tree and digs the well questioned jack again he will give him the princess for his wife and as much gold as he needs replied the servant and do you think you can dig the well and fell the tree asked the older brother scornfully it is worth trying for said jack at this the older brothers burst into loud laughter and the servant said but whoever tries and fails is banished to a lonely island the king has grown ill-tempered from having his oak made larger and his ground dug into for naught with these words the servant went on his way and the three brothers resumed their journey as they travelled along a sound of hewing and chopping fell on their ears it seemed to come from the midst of a forest high up on a hillside i wonder what that means said jack what does it matter to you asked the others but jack sprang up the hillside while peter and paul lay down grumbling at having to wait for him yet really glad of an excuse to sleep by the roadside presently jack came upon a strange sight it was that of an axe hewing of its own accord at a great tree and at the third blow the tree fell then jack addressed the axe and said so you can hew all alone i can said the axe and you had better take me along with you so jack took the axe and put it into his leather pouch then he joined his brothers and they went on together after a time they came to a great heap of rock and on the other side there was a sound of digging and shoveling i wonder what that is exclaimed jack what does it matter to you grumbled the brothers but jack was already climbing over the rocks so the brothers again lay down to sleep when jack reached the farther side of the great boulder he saw another strange sight a spade was digging and shoveling right through the rock and all of its own accord then jack addressed the spade and said so you can dig all alone i can said the spade and you had better take me along with you so jack took the spade and put it in his leather pouch then he joined his brothers and they went on together they had not gone far when they came to a stream of water i wonder where this stream comes from cried jack what does it matter to you growled his brothers but jack was already running along the bank of the stream and as it was cool and shady there the brothers once more lay down to sleep jack went on and on and the stream grew smaller and smaller till at last he came to a little cave and in the cave lay a little acorn out of which the stream was flowing then jack addressed the acorn and said so you alone furnish water for this beautiful stream i do said the acorn and you had better take me along with you so jack stopped the hole in the acorn with moss 
and put it in his pocket then he joined his brothers and they went on together presently they came in sight of the king's palace i am going to try for the king's reward said jack boldly ho ho ha ha laughed the brothers you will end your days on the lonely island but good luck to you we can travel the faster alone then jack went boldly to the king and told him he was ready to try his hand at hewing the oak and digging the well you know the penalty if you fail growled the king yes your majesty said jack then try said the king and jack drew out his axe and said to it hew away now at the third blow the great oak fell now the princess was looking from one of the windows of the castle and when she saw jack she said to herself i hope he will succeed for though jack's clothing was mean he had the manner and bearing of a true man as soon as the tree had fallen jack drew out his spade and he said to it dig away now and the spade began to dig right through the rock and in a very short time it had a great well made then jack let himself into the well and taking the acorn from his pocket he laid it in a corner of the rock and pulled out the bit of moss flow away now he cried as he clambered out and in a few moments the well was full of water and a little stream went tumbling over the cliff in a beautiful cascade the king was delighted and all his followers shouted then the king said you have done your work well and the prize is yours then he clothed jack in splendid apparel and led him to the princess who was all blushes and as soon as the wedding feast was made ready they were married and lived happily ever after End of section 14section fifteen of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow cowles the lad who visited north wind from descent once upon a time there lived a lad in the north country whose mother was very poor she was a widow and they two were all alone and the only food they had was a little grain one morning his mother said to him lad go to the wee bit of a barn and bring me some grain i must grind it and bake us some cakes there is nothing left in the house to eat so the lad went to the wee bit of a barn and got some grain and came out again but just as he stepped from the door swish came north wind and blew away every kernel then the lad went back into the wee bit of a barn and got a second bowl of grain and as he stepped out the door swish came north wind again and blew all the grain from the bowl a second time well at that the lad went back and got a third bowl of grain and that was all the grain there was left in the barn and when he went out the door swish came north wind a third time and blew away every kernel now we have nothing left to eat cried the lad i am going to north wind and ask him to give me back our grain so off he started and he travelled a long long way but at last he came to north wind's house and he went up and knocked boldly on the door then north wind opened the door with a bang good day said the lad good day roared north wind i came to return your visit said the lad my visit roared north wind yes said the lad as fearless as could be you came to our house and snatched away all the grain from my bowl and now my mother and i have nothing left to eat i came to ask you to give it back wee oui, wee oui, said north wind with a shrill whistle as bad as that why i didn't know it was all the grain you had i can't give it back because you see no two grains are in the same place but i'll do the best i can here is a tablecloth you may take home with you whenever you are hungry say cloth spread the board and give me somewhat to eat and you will have a better feast than ever your grain would make so the lad thanked north wind tucked the tablecloth under his arm and went away but he had come far and it grew dark before he reached home so he turned into the door of an inn for a night's lodging as he was hungry he sat down beside a table and laid his cloth upon it and said cloth spread the board and give me somewhat to eat immediately the cloth was covered with dishes 
of substantial food besides dainties the like of which the lad never had seen before he ate heartily while the landlord and his guests stood by in amazement but while the lad slept that night the crafty landlord stole away the magic cloth and put another which looked the same in its place in the morning the lad tucked the cloth under his arm and hastened home that he might share his breakfast with his mother but when he laid the cloth on the table at home and spoke the magic words not even a crust of bread appeared well cried the lad for he was a sturdy lad i will go to north wind again so off he trudged as before and knocked boldly at the door of north wind's house bang the door open and good day said the lad good day said north wind that tablecloth that you gave me is not any good said the lad it served me one good meal but no more i want the grain that you snatched from my bowl i cannot give you the grain said north wind but i will do the best i can here is a hen take it with you and when you have need say hen hen give me a golden ducat and every time the hen will lay a golden ducat for you fine said the lad then he thanked north wind and tucking the hen under his arm he started off when he reached the inn it was again dark so he turned in for the night but as he had no money to pay for his supper he said to the hen 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 give me a golden ducat and the hen laid a golden ducat and the landlord and his guests all stood about and wondered but while the lad slept the landlord took away the hen which the north wind had given and in its place put one of his own hens of the same color when the lad wakened he hastened away home to show his mother the wonderful hen but when he said hen hen give me a golden ducat the hen laid nothing at all well cried the lad for he was a plucky lad there is nothing for it but i must visit north wind again so off he started and reaching north wind's house he knocked boldly on the door good day said he as the door banged open good day said north wind i have come for the grain that you snatched from my bowl said the lad the hen that you gave me laid a single ducat and now it lays no more well well said north wind we must see about this i cannot give you back your grain for no two kernels are in the same place but here is a good stout rope it can tie up a thief in a twinkling and no man can untie it you have only to say tie rope tie and the thief is caught if you want to let him go say loosen rope loosen and the knot will untie then north wind laughed and the lad laughed for they both had their suspicions and the lad thanked north wind and tucking the rope under his arm he started off as it grew dark he reached the inn and turned in for the night he placed the rope beside his bed and pretended to sleep presently the landlord came into his room and looked about he carried in his hand a rope which looked just like the one by the lad's bedside i wonder what marvellous thing the rope can do he said to himself putting out his hand to take it when the lad cried tie rope tie and in a twinkling the landlord was bound hand and foot now said the lad do you give me back my magic cloth and my hen that lays gold ducats and when the landlord found that no one could untie the rope and loose him he ordered the magic cloth and the hen to be brought and given to the lad and when the lad had them safe under his arm he cried loosen rope loosen and immediately the rope fell off and the lad gathered it up and went on his way he went straight home to his mother and said mother you shall go hungry no more i have my magic cloth which spreads a feast my good little hen which lays gold ducats and a rope to tie the thief who tries to steal them from me and we will blame north wind no more for snatching away our grain for he is a right good fellow after all end of section fifteen